Okay, we are back for the final main theme of this series, which is gender stereotypes. So I'm going to go through some stereotypes that we hold about the, the different genders and talk about um, how they relate to actually more commonly sex than gender. All right, let's talk about aggression. Uh, so there is a sex-based difference in how often you know, physical aggression actually happens between boys and girls. So we've got the blue bars are the boys and the red bars are the girls. And you see that boys are on average more aggressive in the sense of resisting authority, yelling and teasing, harming property and harming people. Now, if we expand this out and we look at boys versus girls and then fifth grade versus eighth grade, Okay, so the blue bars are the boys and the orangey reddish ones are the girls. The lighter color bars are fifth grade, the darker color bars are eighth grade. And so let's look at just general physical aggression. You see that the boys at both grades are way more physically aggressive than the girls. And then when we look at verbal aggression, we see very similar scores, don't we? Where males and females are much more um, similar on verbal aggression. Go one more over, we see social ostracism. Oh, that is the purview of the girls, apparently, because the boys, they just really ostracism means um, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. In fifth grade, they might have been saying stuff like that. But by eighth grade, like no one's saying that, whereas the girls are definitely saying that. And then we have malicious rumors, which it looks like nobody's really doing in fifth grade. Um, the boys are not doing it in eighth grade, but boy, the eighth grade girls have certainly discovered the power of the malicious rumor, haven't they? Um, and any women who are listening to this can relate to having been an eighth grade girl. There's a lot of malicious rumors that go around in the eighth grade girl world. Um, so we see a big sex difference in the rates of physical kinds of aggression no difference in the name calling, the teasing, that kind of thing really um, looks, they look very similar. But boy, we see that the girls are doing a lot more ostracism and malicious rumors, and especially by eighth grade with the malicious rumors. So it is kind of a stereotype that is something that would be inaccurate to say that males are more aggressive than females. You have to kind of say, what do you mean by aggression? right? Because it's pretty aggressive to tell somebody that we don't want to be your friend anymore, that you're going to have to start over and find some new people because we don't like you. I mean, that's pretty aggressive, right? Um, so it depends on what you mean by aggression. A malicious rumor can be very aggressive. Anybody who's uh, been the target of a malicious rumor from an eighth grade girl knows that they can be pretty, pretty harmful. Um, so it really matters what kind of aggression we're talking about, whether boys are more aggressive than girls. All right, let's talk about some body language stereotypes. And I have several that I wanted to cover, facial expressions, eye contact, posture, bodily proximity, and touching. All right, and then I tried to make my men and women bubble here and let's see how this little animation works. All right, so um, with facial expression, men tend to have less expression on their face than women do. So I'm talking about adult males versus adult females. Um, when, when we're children, there aren't very many differences in this kind of thing. But by adulthood, men have internalized the idea that they should not be smiling as easily as women do. Um, they try not to look angry unless it's like, really, it's time to get aggressive about it. Um, they try not to look sad. So facial expressions tend to just be muted in men compared to women. Um, men don't like to make eye contact very much. Women love to sit like face to face while they're talking to their friends and really, you know, look at each other. Um, whereas men are, they really reserve eye contact for situations that might be either um, leading to something romantic, or might be potentially going to lead to some kind of, um, you know, some kind of aggressive act. So um, anything in between that, men don't really like to maintain eye contact as much as women do. Um, when they do, interestingly, when men do hold eye contact, they oftentimes will hold it too hard. Like they will actually hold a person's eye contact while having a conversation and not do this sort of um, socially appropriate look away periodically thing. So um, the, the eye contact from men is not quite as skillful as the eye contact from women. Um, 
men in space tend to just hold their body in a more relaxed position. They let their knees fall open. They um, might put their hands on top of their head and have their elbows out and just sort of occupy a lot of space. Um, women are much more likely to cross their legs. Some women can even like cross their leg, wrap their foot around their calf and just like be in this little tiny knot of not taking up any space. Um, women oftentimes when they have their legs crossed will even have like their hands on their knees sort of leaning forward and sort of like containing all their body in, in the smallest possible ball. Whereas men are a lot more likely to sort of be taking up extra space. Um, you guys might have heard the term man spreading. Because a lot of times on like public transport or whatever, here's the man sitting in a very relaxed position and here's his female, you know, stranger seatmate who's trying not to touch him. Uh, so they're all touch, you know, all tied up in a ball, trying not to um, get into his space while meanwhile he's spreading out into her space. Um, bodily proximity, on average, uh, men tend to keep people at arm's distance and whereas women are more likely to go ahead and let people into their personal bubble. Um, even when it's just a friend, women are more likely to sort of have um, touching with their with their female friends. Um, they, it's a way of, for women to show warmth, to show friendship. Whereas for men, touching is usually reserved for either sexual interest or, you know, some kind of aggressive prelude where, you know, I grab your wrist so that, you know, I let, I can control you or whatever. Um, I was just last night watching a rerun of Big Bang Theory where um, Penny is working as a, a pharmaceutical rep and one of the doctors thinks that she's into him because she touched him for two Mississippis. <laughs> and she was just trying to make a sale, of course, and he thought it was a sign of sexual interest. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about looking at this um, lineup of the things that men and women really do different with regard to body language is you can imagine that there are a lot of miscues between males and females um, where they think the other one means something else, right? Something different from what they really mean. We're going to talk about some of those uh, mistaken things later when we talk about attraction. So we'll come back to that. So how about personality traits. Do males and females actually differ on personality traits? Now, this is a study that just came out last year. And so I was really excited about it. Um, because this is looking at um, across time, some of the polls go back as far as 1945. And um, what they were looking at is whether people's stereotyped attitudes about males and females have changed very much over time. And so this first one is displaying a personality trait called communion, and that is the ability to handle people well, to be polite and well-mannered, and to be unselfish. And whereas back in 1945, males and females were rated um, virtually the same. So you see the blue and the red bars being, or lines being touching back in 1945. Over time, they've diverged, diverged, diverged till now 75% of, of respondents assume that women will be behave in these communion types of ways. And virtually no one expects men to behave in those ways. So that's really an interesting change in, um, you know, the attitudes about men and women over time. Um, now, is it true that women are more polite and well-mannered and unselfish? I don't know if that's true or not, but it's the perception is that they have different personality traits. Um, the other one that came out in this uh, same study, the other personality trait that emerged that was kind of interesting is agency. Um, and so agency is defined as the ability to make decisions. And so uh, men have maintained the same level, uh, you know, same number of respondents across time saying that men display agency and women have been losing, um, you know, people who are agreeing with that. So fewer women. Now what's good is that the equal is, on the upward slope so that there a lot of respondents are no longer saying men do this more than women do. They're saying men and women do this equally. So that's good. Um, we're starting to see, um, you know, men and women being viewed as able to make decisions, um, having control over their own destinies, things like that than they use than it used to be. But it's kind of dismaying to see that women one, like nobody's thinking, nobody's really arguing that women are more, full of agency than men are. That's for sure. Um, so kind of interesting. So the perception of males versus females is kind of an interesting one. 
Here we have competence, another trait on this same scale, uh, our same um, report. So back in 1945, men were seen to be more competent than women, right? So you see the blue being higher than the red. And then what we've seen is an inverting and actually equal is the most common answer now. So of course, you guys know what competence is, but I went ahead and defined it there. Um, so now equal is the most common response. And then women are, are higher than men, and then men are at the bottom for competence. So people are very unlikely to say men in 2020, and more likely say they're equally likely. So kind of interesting. Some changes in perceptions. Um, now here we have I don't know if intelligence is technically a personality trait. Whenever I teach the class, it is usually a chapter in the personality textbook. So I guess it must be, you know, it's a trait. Um, and what we see is um, most people are responding that males and females are equal on this trait, which is good. Back in 1945, they were saying men were higher on the trait than women. It switched somewhere in the 60s. And now the most common response is equal. So that's good. People are seeing women as and men as equal in intelligence. So yay, because that's true. There is no difference between the sexes. How about gender stereotypes regarding sexuality? This study came out wow, almost 20 years ago now, they asked people, uh, males and females, the males are in the light blue bars and the females are in the dark blue bars to um, say whether um, sex, casual sex is okay, sex with somebody who you're not committed to. And 60% of males said absolutely and only 35% of females said yes. Um, in the next segment, um, is it okay to, to is it appropriate to, to have sex to express affection? And males were like 25% agreed to that, whereas females, it was about 48% agreed to that. So you see that males are more likely to agree with casual sex and females more likely to agree with sex as a, an expression of affection. And then in the final panel, you see there um, that males are much more likely to report that they think about sex every day than females are. So we do see some sex differences quantifiable um, between males and females with regard to some sexual topics. Going on in that same study, um, in case you were interested um, whether they had studied based on sexual orientation, um, lesbian couples reported having sex less often than gay, gay couples or heterosexual couples. So what Peplau had concluded is that if there was a male present in the couple, there were higher rates of sexual activity than if there was not a male present in the couple. And that kind of makes a lot of sense. Males on average think about sex more often and they engage in sex more often. So um, that kind of statistically makes more sense. Um, women, according to Peplau, um, emphasize the importance of commitment as a context for, sex, context for sex than men do. So women seem to think it's much more important that there be some degree of commitment before sex commences than men think. Um, so that's kind of a sex difference. And these are, um, you know, research-based sex differences, not just sort of stereotypes. Sexual sex, self-concepts. Men, men's self-concepts more often include being powerful, being experienced, being domineering and individualistic sexually. Um, so men's sexual self-concepts include all these characteristics more often than women's self-concepts do. Um, women's self sexual self-concepts are more influenced by their cultural setting or their social setting, um, other kinds of situational factors. For example, they found that after attending university, men are twice as likely to identify as gay or bisexual, whereas women are nine times as likely to identify as lesbian or bisexual. So after having been in the university setting, um, women are much more likely to have an impact on their sexual self-concept than men are. Now, men are twice as likely to change their, change their um, sexual orientation um, statements than if they haven't been to university, but women are nine times as likely. So they are much more likely to uh, express uh, a different sexual orientation than if they hadn't gone to university. So clearly the cultural, the situational factors influence um, self-concepts. All right, that concludes our very brief and hopefully quite just interesting <laughs> discussion of um, biological sex and then gender effects. All right, I will see you in the next segments.